Hello and welcome to Pod Songs, where we interview inspirational people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today, my guest is the musician Nicholas Gunty of Francis Luke Accord, and his guest is Reverend James Martin. Hello, guys. Welcome to the show. Good to be with you. It's Thanks great so to much. have you. Really appreciate the union, Jack. Thank you. Second time for you, Nick. What an honor. You're in an elite club. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or elite club now that uh, Father James is with us. Yes. Yeah, you can, you can call me Jim through the whole interview. Otherwise, Father James is going to be a little unwieldy. <laughs> is, that, um, is that what you were called growing up? Jim, Jimmy, yeah, sure. I mean, unless you want me to call you, I always joke with people, unless you want me to call you Mr. Nicholas through the whole thing, you can call me <laughs> Jim. <laughs> Or Mr. Okay. Jack and Mr. Nicholas. <laughs> Maybe you could just um, start kick us off, Nick, by saying why you why of all the, all the people in the world you wanted to introduce Jim. I appreciate that question, Jack. I chose you, Jim, because, uh, like you, I am also a Catholic. I find Catholics who, how should we say this, go against the grain and uh, stick up for what they believe in to be some of the most inspiring people on the planet. And you're one of them. Well, thanks. That's really nice. And plus, plus I'm from Philadelphia, which is another feather in my cap. A right? little, little <laughs> cherry on top that I <laughs> expect. Yeah. What was, uh, what was it like growing up in Plymouth meeting? <laughs> That's such a great question. Um, you know, I was kind of a typical suburban kid. Um, very Brady Bunch. I uh, grew up in a what is now called a mid-century modern house uh, with all of our mid-century modern furniture, which always makes me laugh. It's like, yeah, that was just the furniture we had. Um, yeah, uh, you know, sub suburbs, uh, riding my bike to school. Um, the big thing would be going into Philadelphia once in a while. I always laugh at uh, kids these days who go on these amazing field trips, uh, like sometimes overseas. My my nephews who live in New Jersey, um, they would go to Washington and Boston. And I said, my gosh, the field trips. I said, when we were growing up in Plymouth meeting, our big field trip was Independence Hall, or as they call it in Philly, Independence Hall, uh, and and the 7-Up bottling plant in Conshohock in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so it was a pretty... It was a pretty normal 1960s, 1970s upbringing. Nothing really special, frankly. But I think, you know, looking back on a kind of a charmed time, you know, no, you know, riding your bike to school and, you know, no safety belts in the car and, uh, <laughs> you know, all that kind of crazy stuff. No, but, no, no bike, but no bike helmets, that's for sure. And we uh, all somehow lived. <laughs> an important detail. What did you <laughs> be doing when you were growing up? What was some, what were some of your favorite ways to pass the time? I like to read a lot. I was a big reader. Uh, I like to play tennis. Uh, I like to sit on our back porch and just, you know, read and do nothing. Um, I drew a lot. I was a drawer, I guess you could say. Um, Artist. Exactly. Art, wow. Well, not, I, yeah, I guess, um, uh, I'm trying, I'm struggling to think of, you know, you're going to have, I don't think I've ever admitted this in any setting ever, but, um, I was a member of a band <laughs> when I was like 10 called you ready for this i don't know where we came up with this called the sidewinders and we played like monkeys the monkeys and i i, I mean this is like kind of lost in the mist mists of time but that's my one connection to to probably the world that you're living in what, what um, did you play what did you prefer? oh i i can't even remember <laughs> some probably some plastic guitar or something like that we had I drew like a little logo for us and uh, we, we sang in people's backyards. I think I, I, I'm, the miss must've been like eight or nine years old, but I remember, I remember that the name of the band, the side. So if you ever need to start up a new band, you can, I, I, I give you that <laughs> name. You're, you're giving that one to me. That's I would, a... yes. I give you that name and you can, you can resurrect that. You know, it was like last trend of Clarksville um, monkeys and the Beatles. I'm old enough to have been alive when the Beatles were, you know, sort of rounding out their time. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, um, yeah, you know, I, 
Uh, that's funny. I think that means that you probably got into music before I did. <laughs> yeah, but I think you're a little better. Well, you know, when did you when did you start? When did you, I mean, you must have you're you're clearly younger than I am. When did you start uh, your your music career? Um, I appreciate that. I uh, I started my music career a little bit after college. My uh, a friend of mine uh, and I moved to Chicago to start a band, a folk band together. Um, but I had been playing music for a good amount of time, obviously, before I decided to start a band. Um, I, I played music, a, a lot of different instruments since I was about sort of 10. So maybe around the same time. Cool. Um, yeah. So you started when, like, is this like the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s? <laughs> this is the late 90s. Uh, the late 90s. 89. Well, you'll be happy to know I'm also, I'm a big I don't, I, I don't think this is why you chose me. I'm a big folk music person, believe it or not. Some of your favorite bands. Well, I'm going to tell you something. This is a little bit obscure. Well, you obviously would know it. I, well, I, I'm a big fan of the Roaches. Mm. Um, and uh, I've gotten to know uh, Terry Roach. And believe it or not, she did recently a song based on a prayer that I did. Um, huge Roaches fan. Now, I'm also going to, I'm also going to test your I was a huge fan of a band that I used to see in the eighties uh, called the Washington squares. Does that, does that ring a bell? Well, look them up. I'm actually happy that you don't know. Cause I feel like I'm like, you know, Mr. Insider, the Washington squares were a New York folk band and you'll, you hear this stuff and you'll just love it. It's just, it's just amazing stuff. Um, and I was really into, uh, so I, I was in New York in the, 1980s which i just the early 80s which i just think is like the best time for music ever um and i would go down to all these clubs downtown this is pre entering the jesuits obviously and uh you know i would see people like steve forbert do you know steve forbert yeah i've i think i've opened for him once yeah i just that that kind of stuff that kind of music the washington squares were a local they didn't they never made it really big um people like i saw people like suzanne vega like early on um yeah no i mean this is this is the benefit of being old <laughs> because you say stuff and people are like wow you heard them uh and uh and then the roaches i got really into the roaches so um i love that whole scene i just i really do i'm not just saying that because you're in a because you know, i have folk band position i uh, really do i really do and also i think that's the greatest era for music mm, do you well i just i mean i'm obviously biased i mean <laughs> But, you know, I was in college from 1978 to 1982. And that's, you know, I mean, that, I mean, as you know, I don't have to tell you this, you know, that's the end of disco, but the beginning of New Wave and, uh, you know, the police and Blondie and gosh, and I mean, I, you know, the Smiths and yeah. all those. I just love them all. I love them, love them. That's what I listen to these days, you know, when I get up in the morning. Okay. That was um, going to be another question of mine is, are you listening to uh, Gregorian dirges or are, or are you? <laughs> well, you're going to, you're going to laugh, but I mean, I listen. you're going to laugh. You're going to think I'm making this up, but I'm not. Um, I listen to the Ramones a lot. Um, I listen to Elvis Costello. Um, I listen to eighties pop music, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, the Smiths and all those kind of, all those bands from that time, which I just think it's, it's, I've always thought that no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going in an area that is not my forte, but I've always thought that disco was like this kind of uh, sort of big feast, you know, like kind of this, like all this like cake and it's just very sweet and stuff. And I've always thought that uh, New Wave was like a shot of espresso. That was my image. It was just kind of cut through all that crap, you wow. know? That is quite an image. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just like zing. And I, I know this sounds crazy. And I, I don't normally talk about music, but I've always thought that like the first, the first note of Roxanne, you know, the police hit, you know, which is that high, you know, Roxanne, that's just cutting through all the disco that, that I kind of grew up on in high school and just like clearing the way for all these amazing bands. So I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of that era. I don't really talk about, I talk more about Jesus, but I don't really talk about <laughs> the Ramones on podcasts. No, that's so interesting. I feel like, in some ways, we're all really deeply shaped by the world as it was when we sort of became an adult. Yeah. And I think that's also an interesting topic because I feel like the process of becoming an adult is sort of a lifelong evolution, right? 
Mm -hmm. So maybe it's like, we're kind of constantly changing our tastes, but I feel like in some ways we're also always constantly going back to some of the things that we loved. I think that's right. And I think it, you know, it's a time in my life where I just felt really kind of free and adult. And, uh, but I really, I just think that that music from, you know, 82, 83, and it just, I just love it. And I, I, I find it hard to, I mean, I listen to stuff today, but I'm not nearly as kind of enthusiastic about it. Um, but anyway, just the look up the Washington squares. I will. Um, they have a lot of great tunes and um, they have one, my favorite one, I think it's called, a. Uh, Riding on the D train. They have a whole thing about riding on the D train. <laughs> awesome. It's, uh, it's there. It's going to be the first thing I do. Yeah. After. It's, I think it's, uh, you know, riding on the D train line, um, get up in the morning, um, riding in a hole to a job I hate. That's one of my favorite. That's a, isn't that a great lyric? Good segue to bring us back onto sure. the, 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 list of questions that I've actually prepared for this. Okie doke. Uh, which, and, the, and I guess the first question I wanted to ask is, uh, so you came from uh, a life in corporate America before coming to the priesthood. Yeah, riding in a hole to a job I hate, mm -hmm. right? Do you, is that how you felt? Towards the end, I did. I mean, I went to the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. I got a job at General Electric, formerly great company, now fallen on hard times. Uh, and, you know, at the beginning, it was really exciting. And, you know, frankly, for a lot of the reasons that we were talking about, um, which was, you know, I was living in New York. I was a yuppie. I was going to all these clubs. I was seeing all these, I mean, you know, all this great music and dancing, having fun and doing all sorts of other stuff, which, as we say in the Jesuits, I will pass over in silence. Um but then eventually I just realized, gosh, this, this work, the work that I'm doing, you know, business is a real vocation for a lot of people, but the work that I was doing, which is accounting finance, then I moved into uh, HR, human resources. I just found it, it just wasn't for me. And I started to hate it. Um, you know, it's just, everybody has their own vocation, right? Uh, and for me, that wasn't it. Uh, and then I stumbled on the writings of a Trappist monk called Thomas Merton. Uh, and that really changed things for me. And I thought this is a better way to live for me again, you know, I have tons of people who I know who are in business still. So that was the, that was kind of the move, um, from corporate America to a uh, Catholic religious order, which all my friends were horrified by. <laughs> That's about the writings of Thomas Mert drew you in. Oh man. You know, so for those who don't know him, uh, he was a Trappist monk, uh, he wrote a biography, hugely um, popular biography called The Seven Story Mountain in 1948. Is that right? 1948. And um, he, he, he talks about his life in the monastery. And, you know, frankly, what drew me in was first a TV show. I, I was I turned on PBS one night. And I saw this documentary about this guy who I'd never heard of. I didn't know who Thomas Merton was. And just the life in the monastery and just seems so romantic, right? And beautiful and certainly more beautiful than my life. So I went out and I got his book and it was like, you know, it was like almost like a fantasy book, you know, like this is this beautiful life. And I thought I'd like to do something like that, but I didn't really know how because we didn't have too many monasteries in Plymouth meeting. And uh, I didn't know any priests or I wasn't super religious, but, you know, one thing led to another. And his his writing is so... His writing is so transparent and lucid and honest, and it's a little over the top sometimes. I mean, the Catholic Church is the the the, the only way, the greatest thing ever, and the, basically his book is monastery good, world bad. But you know, at twenty seven, you know, I mean, you know this at twenty seven, you like that kind of black and white stuff, very very kind of satisfying and appealing. Yeah, comforting in a way. Yeah, Do yeah. You, I guess the, then my next question is, your vocation has changed a lot over the years, hasn't it? Well, I mean, it's the same. You mean in terms of like writing and LGBT stuff? Is that what you mean? And yeah. In terms of, um, uh, well, yeah, exactly. Being, being drawn to a one sort of aspect of, of a certain lifestyle or a certain vision of, of a lifestyle or, or, a, or a calling to yes journey through many different stages of being, becoming a writer, um, becoming an advocate for LGBTQ people. 
Yeah, I think, you know, we, we say a vocation within a vocation. So my vocation is as a Jesuit, um, which is a member for religious order. We take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Um, most people know the Jesuits for their schools. Um, you know, Georgetown, Boston College, uh, St. Joe's, of course, want to shout out to Philadelphia. Um, but um, we're, we're, we're also, we run retreat houses and I've worked with refugees and all sorts of things that Jesuit priests and brothers do. But within that vocation, I've, I, I kind of discovered this vocation as a writer, which I really like. Uh, and then recently, um, working with LGBTQ people, which has been, that's been a real surprise because I didn't set out to do that. And frankly, given that it's probably the most controversial, <laughs> like ministry in the church, I, you know, I don't know if I would have set out to do it, but I feel like God kind of led me into it. So yeah, um, and it's it's marked a big change in my life. I'll, I'll tell you something funny, a little pen or a little Philadelphia related stuff. When I was at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, in so between 1978 and 1982, there was you know there were people who were out, and but not you know we didn't even have the term LGBTQ, and there was a a day every year called Gay Jeans Day, J E A N S, so that you would wear jeans to show your support of gay people at Penn. Okay, it was run by a group called Gays at Penn, University of Pennsylvania. I wore jeans every single day of my life as a college student, except on Gay Jeans Day, because I thought, oh, I don't want to be associated with this group. And so, you know, things have changed a lot. Wow. Wow. Maybe It's this funny, the stuff you do, you know, you're kind of embarrassed to be even associated with this group, which is really pathetic. But, you know, I'm, what am I, seventeen year old kid who just wants to be accepted? Yeah, yeah. Times, times are very different, and mm -hmm. yeah, what even being an advocate looked like was very different. What it oh. meant to be gay was was. I, different. You know, I you know, so I graduated in seventy eight uh, from high school, and and there was no one who was out, zero. I mean, and it would have been unthinkable. I've often told high school kids this when you talk about change, like in someone's lifetime, unthinkable. I mean, I, it was, it was a, you know, gay was a, like a slur and there were a lot worse slurs, but uh, yeah, I knew no one who was gay in my high school and frankly in college either. Do you so. think that, um, do you think, well, okay, maybe this is a question that you can't answer in your official capacity. Uh, at the moment. But one thing that I think uh, I, maybe uh, other people think when they read your stuff and when they watch your, your stuff, do you think that someday the church will embrace queer love fully? Yeah, well, I think it depends what you mean by embrace. Uh, I think what, what's going on right now is that the church is coming to understand and know LGBTQ people, which is, a, you know, like a couple decades too late, right? Um, but everybody's got to start somewhere. Everyone's got to start somewhere. And what does that mean? It means that uh, LGBTQ people, I think thanks to a lot of advances in society, are being more visible, are becoming more visible, uh, are, are coming out. And so the church, by which I mean not just popes and cardinals and archbishops and bishops, but people in the pews, are coming to know them. Uh, and as they come to know them, uh, as people come out, that changes the church. Right. Uh, and so I think they're coming to see um, LGBTQ people in relationships and understanding that is love. Yeah. I mean, I always tell stories of people who I knew, who I know, who are loving people. I'll tell you a quick story. I had had a friend named Carlos. He was, this is a little inside Catholic baseball stuff at our parish. He was a Eucharistic minister, which means he gave out communion. He was a lector, which means he was a reader. Uh, he was a spiritual director, which meant he talked to people about their prayer and where God was. And he was a hospital chaplain at a cancer hospital in New York. He was a pillar of the church, really. He was also gay, and he had a partner named Jim. Carlos got sick, and Jim nursed him through uh, doctor's visits, uh, radiation therapy, um, radiation surgery, chemotherapy, all this kind of stuff. And Carlos died. And, you know, Jim spent years with him, caring for him. And I always say to people, is that love? And it's the question for the church to answer. Is that love? 
Now, I would say yes. And I think the more that people come to see and know and understand people like Carlos and Jim, the more they see that. And it is happening. I'll tell you something funny. Well, I think it's funny um, or ironic. One of the things that is flying under the radar of a lot of people is that if you think about it, more and more people are coming out these days. Um, that means more and more cardinals, bishops, priests, and sisters, and brothers have nieces and nephews who are gay. And that's just changing stuff. Wow. It I just is. Thought, I had not really thought about that, but that's such Isn't a Isn't that interesting? Yeah, they, they just do now. Now, yeah. some people may not be as accepting, but it's happening, and it's just, it's just changing people. So I think it's inexorable. Yeah. Now, whether or not, now, what does it mean by recognize? So I think, you know, there are places in the church where they're talking about blessing same sex unions, you know, as a sacrament. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that will ever be accepted. Like, you know, a, a, a two men getting married in the church or two women getting married in the church. I'm not sure. But, you know, look, I think baby steps, right? First, kind of get to know them, accept them, love them, listen to them um, and see their love as real. Yeah. Wow. You know, I really appreciate hearing that. I think earlier, one of my questions was going to be, do you find that you have to thread a needle when you're sort of walking the tightrope between uh, being an advocate and being employed by? Oh, God? yeah, always. And, uh, you know, I have to be very careful about what I say. And one of the reasons is, I mean, and I don't think a lot of people understand this. That's a very astute question. Um, but what people tend not to understand, and I, I know not everybody's Catholic who's listening to this, but I'm a member of a religious order. And what I say, not because I'm some you know big deal or something, but what I say affects other people in the religious order. Right. So I, for, let's take an example. So I, let's say I say something crazy or I do something crazy. That means that it, it impacts uh, other Jesuits in the country. Because it's like, look at that terrible Jesuit who did X, Y, Z, whatever. That makes it harder for them. That makes it harder for people who are teaching at St. Joe's or Boston College or Georgetown or, or you know, or, or in Italy or wherever. Right. So I have to be really careful because, I it, again, I'm not the official spokesperson for the Jesuit, but what I do matters uh, be, because it affects other people. So I have to be really careful. So, and I also want to do this from within the church. That's, that's, that's my way of doing this, within the church. And I want to respect the church and I want to, and you know, that, that, that comes with certain limitations, but it also comes with certain positive things. I mean, yeah. I can do things that people who are not in the church, um, can't do. Um, so like it's, it's, full, uh, ha have an audience with the Pope. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I were just spouting, you know, shooting my mouth off about something and there's a place for that, right. There's a place for protest. No, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be invited to meet with the Pope, you know? So I think there's different ways of kind of doing advocacy for my, for me. And look, I'll just be blunt. I mean, this is also, I mean, I, I made a vow. I made a vow to God that I would stay in the Jesuits. And I take that seriously. I take my vow of chastity seriously, poverty and obedience. And that, that is really hard for people to get, but you know, it's, it's, it's being part of a group. Right. And, know? and you can't just, you can't just assume that, you can do something and it won't affect the group. You know, I mean, that's it'd be nice, you know, if I could say whatever I wanted to, but I think all of us are kind of in that situation more or less. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to do this from within the church. Yeah. Yeah. And that is intrinsically a difficult position because there is a conflict and you have to be that, that conflict has to work. You know, you're the one who's working through that conflict in some ways, like almost personally as you yeah. be undo it for the way that the church works through it as well. Yeah, because I mean, some people in the church think I'm going too far and some LGBTQ people think I'm not going far enough. A good place to, you know, right in the middle, you know? Yeah, and, and so some, you know, right. and I, I get hatred from, I, actually the LGBTQ community is very supportive, you know, I don't, I don't get a lot of hate, but, um, you know, but from people in the church, boy, even just saying that, even just raising that question of like, is, is my friend Carlos and Jim's love really love? That's horrifying for a lot of people. And I get a lot of, I mean, I really do get a lot of hate and a lot of death threats and all sorts of stuff that I never thought I would get when I was in Plymouth meeting. <laughs> yeah. You know, that brings me to another uh, question that I have for you, which is. You're a very good interview, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. 
I appreciate. You really it. are. Yeah, you really are. Uh, really great questions. Thank you. It's it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks. Ditto. Someone who takes their job seriously, who cares about. Uh, well, I guess actually backing up here, you know, as an artist and especially as a Catholic artist, and I, I say that now, uh, only because I feel like very recently have I come to understand my Catholicism as a part of my vocation and my work. Um, even though I've obviously been Catholic my whole life, but, uh, but for some reason there's something about communicating, uh, Communicating your faith and communicating spirituality through, you know, your profession. I think there's something you, uh, how do I put this? You, you can really only, uh, I guess you can only serve one God. And I think in some ways, uh, like you, you know, I just want my art to be that, that service, you know, that's want, beautiful. So anyway, I guess that's all. No, it's a real voc. That's a real vocation. Thank you. I, I appreciate right? it. Of course it is. I mean, you know, you're, you're doing, I mean, as you know, vocation means to be called and this is your calling and you're living it out, which is beautiful. And to be able to do that in service to God. Yeah, you're right. You can only serve, as Jesus said, you can only serve one God. You want to hear something funny? Um, you, Margaret Thatcher once was quoting Jesus. I just love this. This is a true story. Margaret Thatcher said, as Jesus said, and rightly so. <laughs> so I always say that as Jesus said, and rightly so, you can only serve one God. Yeah, I mean that's that's what it means to live out your vocation and to do it um to do it with joy. And you know, you're obviously you were drawn to music at an early age. This is how we discover our vocations through our desires. And you're living it out, which is great. What a wonderful thing to be able to do with your life, you know, and to bring joy to so many people. It really is a blessing and Mm -hmm. And I also feel that as much as it is joy, it's a burden in some yeah. ways. And I think understanding it as a Catholic, understanding this job as a, as a Catholic vocation has in some ways enabled me to accept the burden in a different way. And what's the burden for you? Uh, strongly financial. Uh, <laughs> I see. Yeah. I think you're going to say like my immense talent is such a burden, you know? <laughs> Uh, no, it's, um, financial though. It's, it's mostly just that being in the entertainment industry and trying to do something that is not purely commercial, uh, doesn't leave a lot of room for error and it doesn't leave a lot of room for, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, when I feel like there's a conflict between pursuing creativity as a, and, and and truth uh, as a goal and pursuing success. And I'm yeah. sure you also have lots of experience. In well, that. I, you know, it's funny. I don't, because I, I don't have experience in that. I'll be honest, because I take a vow of poverty and all the royalties for anything I do, my books mainly go to the Jesuits. So I don't have to worry if it's a bestseller or not. I mean, the Jesuits are happy when it's a bestseller, but I don't see a penny, but I do have experience. I, I know quite a few actors um, and it's that world that I know in terms of their, their struggles, right? I don't know as many musicians, but I know a lot of actors who, the same thing you were talking about, they want to do something artistic. They want to do something creative and true and real, but then they have to, you know, pay the bills, right? right? And, and do stuff that they don't like doing. And also for them, th this is, this is probably off topic, but for them, a lot of it is also kind of demoralizing when they kind of, maybe it's the same for a musician when they have to audition. And they're, I'll never forget it. One of the, one actor friend told me that, which, which is really shocking. You walk into a room, you know, and you've, you've done your part or whatever you've memorized this part and someone will look at you and say, no, wrong, not good for this part. You're so this constant rejection too. Um, and then the financial, you know, most actors aren't doing very well financially, but, um, but you seem to, you've made a go of it. You know, I'm, I'm doing my best. Uh, That's great. But it's, you know, a, really a tribute to Jack as well, uh, for being a part of this and for pursuing his own vacation or vocation in, uh, creating. And vacate. It's okay to pursue vacations too. <laughs> uh, 
here you are. I feel like I'm on holiday. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, and I guess I'm, I'm thinking of all this, I'm bringing all this up because, uh, I think I mentioned in the email when we were initially emailing about this interview that I think of ministry and art as having sort of a same, the same goal, the same purpose in some ways of, um, of just speaking truth and sharing stories. That was one of the things that, um, that's really beautiful. You know, I never thought of that. <laughs> Thanks. I, speaking truth and sharing stories as the goal of art and ministry. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it, you know, you know, it's, I'm go ahead. I'm, 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 I keep uh, interrupting you. I apologize. First. Uh, stories I think are hugely important. Stories are what Jesus, Jesus was all about telling stories. And actually a guy that I, I've become friendly with, um, a guy named Walter Brueggemann, uh, who's a scripture scholar, says that, uh, you know, stories unlock things that an argument doesn't, you know, stories kind of open our minds. And, you know, when Jesus is asked, you know, who is my neighbor? He doesn't say, you know, here are the 10 points <laughs> that make up a neighbor, like a PowerPoint presentation. He says, uh, a man went down to Jericho and he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. When he says, what is, when people ask him what God is like, he said, you know, a farmer went out to sow a seed. I just love that. And one of the most, so, so stories are just, and, and we are stories. We are stories, right? When we, so who are you? Well, I grew up here. I did this. One of the most moving things I heard about Jesus ever, and I've heard a lot about Jesus. Um, I was on retreat and someone said, um, uh, so Jesus obviously existed, but so when I, I want to say this kind of in this context, Jesus existed and um, son of God and Jesus of Nazareth and all that. But um, in a way, um, Jesus uh, is the story that God tells to reveal himself. So Jesus is the story of God, which I just love. So his life is a story that reveals who God is. Um, and I've always just loved that. And then Jesus himself tells stories. Um, so, yeah, I think stories are hugely important. And, and with those stories, the truth is revealed. And, you know, to get back to the LGBT stuff, I think if people knew the stories of LGBTQ people, they would understand them. Right. That was a big part of your meeting with the Pope. If it, right. Am I right about that? Yeah. 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 You're talking, talking about LGBT stuff. Yes. Telling. Yeah. Story, yeah. That, the lived story yes. experiences of the LGBT. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing. Some things I can't share because they're he, he asked this stuff to be private so we could just kind of, you know, speak off the cuff. Um, but uh, I, I told him stories of certain LGBTQ people that I know um, just to kind of help him, you know, understand their situation. But, you know, he knows LGBTQ people himself. You know, he's one of the things that we reported. I have that we have this website now called outreach.faith, which is for LGBTQ Catholics. And one of the things we reported is that the Pope has met for the past couple of months monthly with transgender people. Wow. So he knows them, you know, he's, he's gotten to know them. Um, but yeah, he was, he, I'll tell you something funny at the very beginning, the first time I met him, and it's only been twice. And it's, it's a big deal for me in 2019, I walked in and I sat down. I mean, I was like, you know, it's like amazing. And, uh, I said, so someone said to me, the etiquette is he's super relaxed too. And he's a Jesuit. So I felt really at home. Someone said, look, he invited you, you ask him what he wants to talk about. I was like, that's a good, that's a good thing to know. You know what I mean? Instead of going in there like guns blazing. Uh, so I sat down and I said, uh, Holy Father, this is through a, a translator. Uh, what would you like to talk about? And he opened his arms and he goes, what would you like to talk about? <laughs> so then we went into LGBT stuff. Um, yeah, it was great. It was I, I, telling stories and him telling me stories. Yeah, so, what did you learn from those meetings? Oh, man. Um I think the most profound, well, first of all, how wonderful he is. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I mean, I felt totally relaxed. He's very funny. He tells jokes. He's really warm. I mean, look, truly, who am I that the Pope should be meeting with me? I mean, really. Like, I'm not a cardinal. I'm not an archbishop. I'm not president of some university. I'm not blah, blah, blah. I'm just this guy in his, you know, who does this LGBT stuff, you know, who a lot of people hate. And yet he invited me. Um, and I, I, I think just his, his spending time with me was really moving for me. 
But the thing that he said, I can share this because he he shared it in a letter that I was able to share. At the very, I'll tell you a funny story. This is actually funny. So I'm I'm with the Pope and I'm just like uh, kind of gaga and I'm going through all this stuff that I'm talking about, LGBT stuff. And he's responding and listening and just really being, he's totally attentive. He's totally getting it as tracking, as we say. And at the end, I realized, you'll appreciate this. I said, oh my gosh, like I've been, as I have been this morning, I've been like dominating this conversation. Like I, he is like, maybe he wants to ask me something else. So I said to him, Holy Father, is there something I can do for you? Meaning like, you know, do you want to ask me about, I don't know, the church in the United States or whatever. And he said in Spanish, um, which was, I really, I'll never forget it. He said, what you can do for me is you can continue this ministry in peace. Compass. And it was the in peace stuff that really meant the most to me. Yeah, because this mission is inherently conflicted it's not very peaceful at times um but isn't that beautiful continue this ministry in peace wow and i just love that and so and then i saw him again a couple months ago and it was even more relaxed mm. he was just laughing and i spent like 45 minutes with him and then i came out and uh <laughs> it's funny there was an entire so you go in and you know it's in his the apostolic palace and there are these huge waiting rooms and i go i'm all by myself you know i'm in my collar and i'm all by myself and i go in and then i come out 45 minutes later and there's like 40 bishops waiting to see him wow you know it's the it's the dutch bishops conference wow. and they're all looking at me like who is this guy <laughs> it was pretty funny i know they have like their secretaries and their briefcases and i just it's just me <laughs> So it is, it's just, it's amazing. Um, but anyway, I, I, what I learned from him is kind of the, that, that compass with peace, which is the way he does his ministry. He doesn't let stuff bother him. Right. Right. He doesn't, he doesn't bother him. Yeah. Which is the way Jesus was. Jesus didn't let people bother him. <laughs> um, do you, what, what is your, what is your, well, actually, I guess I want to ask a mundane question here. Yeah, what sure. Is, the rest of your week look like this is holy week uh that we are in right now it is tuesday of holy week do you celebrate mass regularly mm -hmm. at your uh, living house uh so in our jesuit community um we have mass every day sometimes um you know you're on it's on a schedule right so it's, there's 12 guys so you're on a big 12th day roughly uh and then i also help out at a jesuit parish um in the city. So a parish, this is confusing for people, but it's a Catholic parish that happens to be run by the Jesuits. Um, and I help out there and I am not on the roster for what's called the Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and, uh, the Easter vigil, but I'll, so I'll go to mass, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a church and sit in the pews like everybody else. Um, but I, but I have been, I have done those masses in the past, but you know, it's like when you're scheduled, when you're not scheduled. Right. So, yeah. So the next couple of days, it's going to be a lot of masses. A lot of time in church. Yeah. Um, do you have any Easter traditions that are, do you, did you, did your family have any Easter traditions growing up? And do you? Yeah. Have? We weren't super religious. Um, we would get, we would have a family dinner on Easter, sometimes with relatives, sometimes not. My mom, the biggest Easter tradition, my mom would make this amazing asparagus, cold asparagus. It was steamed asparagus. I know this sounds weird. It was Sicilian with, parsley and sliced hard boiled eggs on the top with vinaigrette wow amazing yeah it was amazing and you know ham it's the sort of easter ham but you know we'd go to mass um we weren't super religious we'd go to mass on easter sunday we'd dress up we'd come home we'd have our early dinner kind of the end and maybe we'd have a, a lamb cake remember those like a, a lamb coconut lamb cake which is yeah well you know lamb of god i don't think yeah, I, I know yeah well they were they were it's a little strange but they were till they were tasty. I mean, now it's more now I'm in mass, you know, I'm I'm in mass Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, Easter Sunday. So it's mass, mass, mass. I never I never went to any of those when I was little. I didn't even know what they were. Uh, did you so your yeah, so your family was not super religious growing up. Mm -hmm. Didn't any uh sort of blink 
let's sort of do a double take when you uh, decided, when you told them that you were going to be a priest. <laughs> oh, that's an understatement. <laughs> no, they hit the roof. And all my friends thought I was crazy. Like legitimately crazy. One of my friends said, I'll never forget this. I always tease him about it. He's still a friend, friend from GE. His name's Chris. He said, uh, I said, I'm, I'm leaving the Jesuit. I'm leaving GE and I'm entering the Jesuits. And he was like, well, what, is, what is that? And I said, well, it's a religious order. He said, what are you going to be a priest? And I said, yes. You know, I was all full of myself. Yes, I'm going to be a priest. And uh, he said, well, he was just kind of stunned. And he said, I, I, I think you should see a psychologist. And I said, I am seeing a psychologist. That's, that's how I, I got to this decision. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, I think you should see another psychologist. Because <laughs> clearly the, that psychologist is not good. No, they were horrified. My mom cried. My sister cried. Everybody cried because, you know, I was giving up everything and they would never see me again and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they didn't. And I just sort of sprung it on them, which was not very nice. I mean, not in a mean way, but I just I just did. And, you know, all the stuff about, oh, you know, you know, our parents have prayed for your vocations and they prayed. Not not my parents. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Sometimes on. um certain feast days in our chapel, people will say, we pray for our parents who nurtured our vocations, who prayed for our vocations. And I said, I'll pray for my parents, but they didn't really do that. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, when you, I, so when we first opened up this conversation, um, you mentioned the abuse scandal and mm -hmm. you, Became a priest in 1999. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What What were your thoughts when? I mean, this is this is kind of the height of. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I I entered the Jesuits in 1988. Um, at 27, I was ordained. It's a long training period. I was ordained in 1999, and then the abuse the abuse scandal really broke in 2002 in Boston, and that has continued. Um. Yeah, I mean, horrified in every possible way. Horrified for the victims, uh, sort of incredulous that this stuff could have happened. I mean, you know, we know abuse happens and I mean, most abuse happens in families and we know it happens in the Boy Scouts and I mean, all sorts of, you know, can fill in all the blanks. But I mean, in the church, uh, priests doing this to children uh, and adolescents. Yeah, I mean it's horrifying, and it was, and and also deeply shaming. Because for a time there, the the main view of a priest was you're a pedophile, um, and so yeah, just just and and that there there's so many kind of levels of it, and I think also anger at the church for for not addressing it earlier, for not addressing it at all. You know, I think actually we're doing a good job of addressing it, and you know, all those guys have been kicked out, and there's all sorts of uh, strictures and things like that. But yeah, I mean, the, the huge damage that was done and then the damage that the, the sort of, I always think of this as, this is kind of theological. That was it. These are intense sins. I mean, really intense sins and crimes and the multiplier effect. So of course the, the most, uh, the most pain is the victim, right? The, the, the victim and then the victim's family. Right. But then you have kind of the, the people who are, um, demoralized by it in the parish and who are angry. And then you have kind of, and these are legitimate payouts. We should definitely pay people. Then you have ministries that can't happen because of the payouts, you know, because of, because of the cost. And so it's just this kind of ripple effect of, of sin, of what happens with sin and, and crime. So yeah, it's just hugely demoralizing and sad and angering too. For a while, I lived with two guys who were um, removed from ministry because of abuse. So I had to live with these guys. Wow. Mm hmm So anyway, so really just on so many levels, horrible. Yeah. What would you say to a Catholic person who has lost their commitment to the church because of it? Oh, because of that? Well, first of all, I don't blame them. I mean, these are horrible things. Uh, you know, first of all, I listen to where they are, right? And I try to hear what they have to say. I share some of my own stories. Um, at the same time, I say, you know, this 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 organization is always every church, every every human organization has always been sinful, 
right? Every church, every human organization. Um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, look at something like the Boy Scouts. I mean, I was a, I was a Cub Scout, right? I mean, uh, and so to kind of, to kind of say that, you know, the, the search for a religious organization without sin is going to be a search without end, right? Um, and that, you know, if you're, if you're Catholic, this is, this is what you were kind of born into, but I never, I never kind of critique people who, who, who decide to leave. For me, I decided to stay um, and try to help the organization from within in that, but also in the LGBT stuff. Right. I also, you know, I, I think sometimes people lose their faith in God and that's where I'm a little stronger. I say, look, the, the, the human organization is not God and you need to make the distinction between faith in God and kind of, you know, kind of fealty or trust in a religious organization. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that does not, that is never affected. It's not like I don't believe God exists because of that. Right. It's, it's more in the organization, but I, I try to take people where they are. You, uh, I, I, maybe someday I'll in, introduce you to my mother. She would love you. <laughs> oh, nice. Where is she's in the Midwest, right? She's in the mid Midwest. Uh, both of my parents, uh, take very much the same philosophy. Um, and, uh, I think are the reason why I still am able to sort of separate my spirituality and my, uh, my understanding of myself as a Catholic and my understanding of the church as its own thing. And, uh, yeah. So I, I, I think that's a perspective on religion that really resonates with me and with a lot of people, I think these days. Yeah. And I always say, look, it's like your family. I mean, your family may do things you don't agree with, but most people don't sort of disown their families or even their country from a, on a, on a less fraught level, even believe it or not, that politics can be less fraught than religion. You know, people that don't agree with whoever is in the white house. Right. And I know there are people who are very strong about Democrat, Republican. They don't leave the country. And I say the same thing. Did you, did you, if you didn't like Trump, did you leave the country? No, I not. Well, I'm an American. I, this is my home. If you don't like Biden, are you to leave the country? No, because I'm an American. So that that's kind of the same idea that this is this is your family. Um, and I, I also see it as a kind of responsibility to help the church kind of, you know, confront this. And I think we have actually. I think I think there's been lots and lots of great steps forward. And, you know, the priests, anyone who is credibly accused, as they say, is removed immediately. Right. You know, as they should be. Yeah. So, but no, it was a terrible time. That was really horrible. Well, thank you for that answer. It's very sure answer. And I, I think that it's marked by the same compassion that you bring to your LGBTQ ministry that, um, that, uh, the church is bigger than it's, uh, than it's worst actors. And that, uh, this is a church that belongs to all of us and that, uh, taking Maybe not ownership is not the right word, but responsibility for yeah. that is. Well, yeah. And the other thing is, um, you know, today when we're recording, the gospel reading is Jesus telling Peter he's going to deny him three times. And then he does. <laughs> uh, and, you know, one of his best friends betrays him and ends up, you know, causing his execution. And so the church is founded on these guys who were sinful. Right. And Jesus still picks them. <laughs> I mean, so Peter denies him three times and Jesus, after he you know, is resurrected from the dead. We believe, I believe he forgives them. And then he says, I want you to be head of the church. So it's all the way back to the beginning, this, this sin. And I, I think people, I think people really, I think that that helps me understand that's always been flawed. You know, the church has always been flawed. And I mean, the church in kind of the larger sense, you know, not just the Catholic church. Right. Yeah. Um, we're nearing uh, the end of the interview now. So I want to ask you, what are you reading now? I'm reading uh, actually a book called The Silent Spring Revolution um, by Douglas Brinkley. It's this monstrous, like 10,000 page book. But it's uh, it's about um, Rachel Carson, who's a big hero of mine, you know, Silent Spring and conservation movement. I read this book years ago. This is uh, it's called to, to a farther shore. Um, and it was by a guy named William Souter, I think. And it was the biography of Rachel Carson. I saw a PBS special on her and I just find her fascinating by the way, she, which I didn't know she was also a lesbian. I don't know if you knew that. I did not. 
And she did her environmental work as she was wrote Silent Spring, which I remember from the 60s, sort of against DDT and one of the first kind of books on and sort of that heralding the conservation movement. <laughs> And she did this as she was dying from cancer. So what? It's an incredible life. And so, I I I like that whole world. So I'm reading that. Um, yeah. And then I read a lot of magazines too. So, <laughs> what about you? What are you reading? Uh, right now, I am. I just started uh, Annie DeFranco's memoir. Oh wow! Do you know Annie DeFranco? I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's sort of '90s folk. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm only just getting into it, but as a figure, I've always been fascinated with her and with her, uh, the way that she was a trailblazer, uh, mm -hmm. in, in so many ways, but largely, you know, through folk and singer songwriting and, uh, also with her label and I just, I've always found her to be a fascinating person and I've, I've not really known a lot about her career, about her life. And so, uh, I decided to, to dig out her memoir and it's full of, of amazing stuff. She's a very blunt writer <laughs> and, uh, she's also a great poet and there are, uh, mm -hmm. poetry interspersed through the whole book. Um, so it's a, it's a good read. Well, that's cool. Do you have, let me ask you, cause I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in talking with experts about what they're expert in. Who are your, who are like your folk heroes? Ooh. Um, oh, that's a, put me on the spot here, Jim. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> let's see. You know, I, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, uh, really, oh. uh, sort of uh, that, that era of music, Simon and Garfunkel, Cat Stevens. Oh, I love Cat Stevens. Yeah, that was the stuff that my parents were playing when I was <laughs> right. Well, that's 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 my generation. Cat Stevens is that just amazing voice too. Anyway, I'm sorry. So Simon well, and Garfunkel, that's interesting. I love. I mean, I I love that whole era um, of music, but those are really two. Wow, stand out um, from yeah from the time. I, How about uh, people like? Do you like? People like Joni Mitchell and hey, yeah, I love Joni Mitchell. Um, uh, did you see her? Did you see her Newport thing uh, last year? Not, no, I missed it. I missed it. I, I mean, I wasn't there, but I've seen it on YouTube. She she sings. You know, she's had this stroke and she's come back. I'm sure you know. And she sings both sides now, and it's just you know at age whatever. Yeah, you have to look. It it's it'll just make you cry. It's so beautiful. And then at the end, she laughs and. It's amazing. She's amazing. She is amazing. And she is also uh, an, in an incredible trailblazer when it comes to the music industry right now and trying to, trying to um, fight for the, the rights and the, and the lives of, of artists, working mm. artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. She's inspiration. What's your favorite Cat Stevens song? Uh, ooh. That's a really good question. Uh, can I throw it to you before I answer? Yeah, I'm, you know, I don't know if this is the title, but the one that starts, Oh, Very Young. Do you know that one? Oh, very young, very young, this, this time. Ooh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, love that. is that the name of the song? I don't know if that's the name of the song. Uh, I know I'm really putting you on the spot. Yeah. I apologize. Jack, check it out. Let's look it on the internet. <laughs> before we go. Yeah, What's go that? Father and Son, I think, is my favorite. Mm. He's right. such a beautiful, a beautiful voice. Yes. Oh. Anyway, oh, those I are have... those are great heroes. Or Cat Stevens. Did you? You have a oh. lovely voice. Uh, wow! Well, thank you very much. You must yeah. check them out after the sh after the show, Jim. Uh, you would really love the harmonies. It's it's it's, uh, it's Simon and Garfunkel for the for the century. Neat. Yeah. I'm happy to. I look forward to it. Kind words, Jack. Thank you. So are you inspired for a song this time? Very. That's sweet. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, and the thing I most want to do is after we're off the air, I want to play uh, some of the Washington squares for you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Love it. Now, can you, while we're, can you queue up? Is it possible to somehow queue up and listen to the Washington squares somehow? Is there, can you do that in some way? With all I, these, all I see you have all these like, you know, things, all these. 
or I can I can share a screen. Can we do that? If uh, maybe we all just hit play on this at the same time. <laughs> yeah, right. let me Spotify. see. Let me see. Let me see if I can find it. I don't even know if I have Spotify. Oh, what's the so, song? So if you go to, yeah, go to Spot. I I assume they're on. I mean, this was like a yeah, really small. Squares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to. Is there a D train? Uh, yes. Right. D train is from. And I uh, want to hear. I just want to see your reaction. And when you hear their, their, they were kind of well. When you hear their their sound i just am curious what your reaction would be shall we play it right now yeah yeah go ahead i want i just want to see what you think you know this is this was that was amazing <laughs> i'm so glad you liked it i mean it's a little repetitive i forgot how repetitive it is you know i don't it, know if it's a i don't know if it's a sin to i always think if i'm a songwriter like if i have like four stanzas like i could at least come up with different lyrics did you see them play live i did many times they were they were um i don't know even how to describe them i'm not really a music historian but they were like a local and i thought they would always kind of hit big because there's and, and if you listen to the other stuff it's a lot of like pro it's very folky they were kind of they they styled themselves if you see a picture they styled themselves as like oh i know what it was like sort of 50s beatniks that was their <laughs> that was their look in the eighties. And I just, I just, that, that, that song is, I mean, that, did you like it? Oh yeah. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking maybe we try to like get some of that vibe into our, our song about. Oh, be cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, to a desk with a phone and a ball and chain. I mean, that is just, I think part of it is also, it, 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 it really appealed to me kind of where I was. It's such a funny line, but their stuff is they have a lot of protest songs and uh, I thought you might like it. So I'm glad I introduced them to you. I, and this is exactly, this is the music. So if, if Cat Stevens uh, was the music mm -hmm. play growing up while she was like cleaning the house or, you know, mm -hmm. chores and stuff. This is the type of music my dad would play when he was. Oh, doing cool! So oh, much. cool. Love, yeah. This is, uh, yeah. This is a this is a wonderful find. I don't uh, think my dad knows about this band, so he's that's gonna... great. Well, I'm glad. I'm happy to have introduced them to you. Um, but listen, thank you for everything. Um, um, right. and also happy to share the podcast whenever it's out. And thank you, Jack, for arranging all this. And really nice to be with you guys. So nice to be with you, Jim. Thank you. All right. So God bless. Great. My pleasure. Happy Easter. Happy, happy Easter. Easter. All right. Take care. Take care. Oh, hey. that went really well. Yeah, yeah. What would you think? Oh, it was great. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> wow, yeah. What a, yeah. Okay. What a what a what a great positive ball of energy. Yeah, totally. I honestly didn't know what to expect. Uh, doing that, like asking him to do this interview. I as you can as you know, I struggled like hard to think of people to who weren't mm. musicians. To, the <laughs> interview and i i think that's partly just because i'm you know it's like the musicians in my life are or musicians are just generally people who inspire me because i am mm. one but the moment i thought of him uh it was actually my fiance who brought him up um, she studies religion and so she i think is a little more keyed into some of these conversations than i am but she um i think she'd been aware of his twitter presence and like some other stuff and mm -hmm. Uh, the moment I started reading about him and was like, just learning about him, I was just like, whoa, this is, this would be a, a fun guy to talk to. And, but I just didn't know what to expect. And I feel like this was a really fun, uh, yeah, a really fun interview to do. Yeah. So what kind of song? I mean, are you going to go for the D train sort of upbeat style or are you? I, I kind of, um, cause you're going solo now and this is not going to be a Francis Luca chord. And, to, right. To, <laughs> to toss around yeah uh, thank you by the way for for agreeing to do this with me just about myself it's no it's worries a, uh, like a project to to work on and to work towards to no well i mean that, that last episode we had was fantastic and uh, actually you're still the our most streamed song i think that's because or not just because it was a great song but because of uh Brian's great playlisting work, which he he should get a lot of credit work. He's a yeah, yeah, yeah. He he really knows what he's doing. Yeah, so, I need someone like I need, I need a Brian. Yeah. Are you are you going solo? Or you think it's a good idea? I mean, even <laughs> no, I I completely agree with you. And honestly, the only reason I feel like I can go solo is because I know Brian 
has my back and is in my corner still. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we will definitely be promoting this this as much as we can, like through our FLA channels as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Hopefully by the time we finish the song, we'll have launched some of those other channels for myself as well. Okay. So yeah. That. Great. Because um, you're so busy. I mean, you're touring a lot. You're, uh, how do you find the time to do solo as well? And it, it's a good question, Jack. I'm, I did not think I was going to be, and you know, the thing is like with freelancing, so much of my work now is freelancing. Um, it's so weird how things are busy sometimes and then not busy mm -hmm. kind of such a weird swing between like the, the intense times and the not intense times. March was very intense. So, um, I'm really glad that we managed to, to <laughs> see, um, yeah, song, uh, let's see topics. Uh, you know, I feel like what really, what really worked with Janet last time was like, was just focusing on some of the mundane stuff, mm. uh, like some of the personal stuff, uh, some of his personal story could be really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was really, um, I was really fascinated. I think, you know, there's, there's, a maybe the first story that I think of is him being a part of corporate America and then deciding, uh, you know, sort of discovering Thomas Merton and then deciding to, to leave it all behind, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, that's a powerful story. Um, obviously his advocacy is a powerful story. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's, I thought you also mentioned the ripples of sin. That was an interesting yes. phrase. Yeah. It's the ripples of sin. Oh, that was. Yeah. Because you don't realize what one thing you do, how it affects everything other else. people. Yeah, yeah. Not just the immediate victim, mm. but the people in the chain of victimhood. Yeah. Which you are one sort of link yeah, yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, you know, I wanted, and I... <laughs> At the end, I forgot to ask him about gun control, which I was going oh. to <laughs> Another topic. That's a, you picked the two huge biggest topics in America. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's good you didn't ask that. You could stick to one. We don't need another hour. Yes. Um, but he did, he did mention Rachel Carson. I kind of want to go look her up a little bit. Um, not super familiar with her work, but, but the idea of um, environmentalism, I think, is like another big thing. Yeah, yeah. Like that I think about a lot in music and that could be a fun like touch point I'm yeah like, it could be anything I mean yeah you sometimes you know you wake up in the morning and the song's there you know or some one line you know it's not it's a three minute pop song it's not uh, it's a folk song it's not going to be you know you can just be inspired by the feeling of interviewing him his energy and uh, right yeah yeah um yeah, what were, did you have any other um, good little little notes? No, no, just that working from within, that's that he's, uh, that, you know, you can change the system sometimes more by by being a part of something you don't entirely agree with than going on alone, which I think is a quite important thing. Yeah. You know, that, that aspect of compromise. Um, you know, you just need, when you have an angle with the song, like, uh, cause with the, with that last, with the last episode with Janet, so, you know, I, I, I wrote a song as well, didn't I? This, uh, I spent my whole life trying to make the, get the world to love. I'd have given it all up just to make you smile. I, so that, yeah. you just need an angle. Yeah. That's very true. I and mean, then, we can a lot of angles. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Do you want to, um, kind of do what we did last time where we just uh come up with like a couple of little nuggets and then uh share them and kind of workshop them yeah that's a good idea i mean but you you know you did such a good job last time i'm quite happy if you to go with what uh what you came up with as well so cool. yeah i mean cool. yeah let's just uh see well, then, how yeah. the inspiration strikes yeah Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. Why don't I give myself the deadline of getting you something 
uh, in like, what is today? Today is Tuesday. Hmm. I'm going to work on it this afternoon, but then I actually have to bolt and take my fiance to the airport. Um, and I give myself the deadline of tomorrow night. Huh? Yep. Think getting a, a, a song nugget. That's sure, like, sure. And it's you. the best way to do it. It's best to just bite the bullet and do it because, you know, you're all, we're all up now. We've had the great conversation. And then if you leave it, if you come back to it in a week, what well, you going to just, you just cold. So yeah. 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 I, well, I feel very inspired by, uh, by this man and by this experience. I watched his documentary last night. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Oh, I didn't it's, know that. It's called Building a Bridge it's on Amazon. I'm not sure if it's available in the UK or in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but, uh, but if you can find it. Uh, Building a Bridge is another good title or another. Oh, yeah. Which is the, it's the title of his book about. Good to steal. You know, great artist yeah. borrow. Definitely. <laughs> no. um, okay, cool. Yeah. Sweet. I think we've got enough. Um, okay. I will get something. Uh, I'll get something to you that hopefully is pretty far along. Uh, okay. By our night and then uh, at the latest, right. we'll go from there. By the yeah, way, your we... is incredible. I really loved how they. Uh, well, they'd love they... to work with you guys again. They were super excited to uh, that you were coming back on. So, and it leave, leave leave some for us, please. <laughs> yeah, you got. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. This is yeah. this is a wonderful show, Jack. I'm so glad that we're friends and that we can do this together and that you No worries. I hope you come on again and make it a regular thing because uh Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, uh, it's so much easier. You know, the second time an artist comes on I have to explain everything and it's you know, it's it's uh I'm trying to get I'm on two I'm on two article two episodes a, a month now, but I want I wanna get it weekly. Yes. That's such a workload, but it hopefully with you know, with with your help. Yeah, it makes well, it a lot, yeah. a lot easier. Well, yeah. I'm glad, man. Uh, yeah, and I'll be working on this as fast as I can so we can just get it done. Yeah, I'm getting more people. I've got Peter Mulvey on, who he taught. He's a good friend of it. Yeah, and Eddie Franco, he's a good friend of... Uh, yeah, he's on there. Um, I met him once. He oh, yeah. was a cool guy. Yeah. Troubadour. Troubadour, yeah, yeah. So we're getting yeah. more, more well-known artists and... Um, oh, congrats. That's a, yeah. Yeah, that's a cool name to have. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's really thanks to you, all your efforts, your, yours and Brian. So, thanks again. Man, yeah, of course. Thank you. It's it's a lovely thing to be a part of. And yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm just grateful, grateful for yeah. you. No worries, mate. All Sweet. right. Well, and 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 people can find you on your. You have any channels yet, or uh... I don't really have channels yet. Let's see. What should I say? Hey, maybe we can record a second thing at the end. <laughs> I'll put them in the show notes. Uh, or Francis Luca Cord okay. everywhere. Right. My website is nicholasgunty.com. Okay. And that place to, to tap. Okay. I mean, and because, also francisluccord.com. Because I know, I haven't heard the song myself, but I know after hearing it, people are going to want to check it out. Check you out. <laughs> Indeed. All right, All right. Jim. Take care, my friend. Take care, buddy. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. I know I'm strong With peace by my side The story is power With truth out in time This one's for all The shame in our lives I need you to call Me by my name I need you to let me be my way The story is power With peace by my side I know I am strong I know I'm alive
happens when they hear what we did. Build the pen, building with stone, building with fire. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the song and the episode. The song will be released next week. It will be available on all streaming platforms, but you can already pre-save. Please support the artists by following them on social media and adding the song to any playlists you have. This is a completely free show, and you've listened this far, so I'd really appreciate it if you could pay us back by clicking like and subscribe. And follow at PodSongs on social media platforms or subscribe to the newsletter podsongs.com for special updates. Or just tell the next person you see about this amazing show where musicians interview their idols and write a song about them. The songs are available for download from the Podsongs website as well, which pays a lot more than the 0.00 whatever we get from Spotify. You can also email me at jack at podsongs.com to give feedback, suggest an artist and guest combos you'd like to hear, or just say hello. We're a listener-supported show, and I'd love to hear from you. A final thanks to my researchers, Dory Verbo and Rosa Marino, my producer, Maurizio Sanicola of Goldmine Records, and musicians, Massimino Vozza and Luigi Falcioni. The next episode will be out soon. In the meantime, you can listen to more amazing episodes in the archives. Until then, have a great day.